But I wanted to bring a few other things into the program as well. We had thought that the Democrats had one chance for sure at passing a major piece of legislation through this process called budget reconciliation, which means that it is not subject to a filibuster. It cannot be blocked by the Republican minority in the Senate. We thought that they had one chance at that and that they used that one chance or one chance for sure that they used that one chance with the COVID relief package, the, the, uh, uh, the, the bill that you know, provided us with the, the, uh, the checks and extended unemployment insurance and expanded health care. I mean, just did a lot of really great stuff. And there might have been a second opportunity to use reconciliation because in 2020, you're supposed to be able to do it once a year. And in 2020, Congress never did it. And so apparently, you know, the Republicans were in charge back then and they got their tax cut of, out of Trump in 2017. And then basically they just, you know, this is a conversation we had yesterday about Matt Gates. What do you do when you paid $174,000 a year to govern, but you have no interest in governing and you don't believe in government? Um, you know, you get drunk, you take drugs, you have sex, you, you, just, you play golf three, three, you know, one out of three days when you're president. Uh, by the way, at this point in time, four years ago, we had spent over a million dollars on presidential golf trips, almost all of it going to Trump properties. We had not spent one penny for presidential golf trips uh, at this point in time in the Obama presidency or the George W. Bush presidency, and we have not spent one penny on a presidential golf trip in the Biden presidency. Uh, it's kind of nice. Things, things are getting better, it seems. But anyhow, we thought we had this one chance, and maybe we had two chances if we could grab last year's reconciliation and say, we're going to do that this year. Maybe even backdate it. But Chuck Schumer, he's, he's turning out to be a wily old fox. He, he went to the Senate parliamentarian and said, okay, we passed this piece of legislation by reconciliation. Can we amend it now? Can we simply take the, the COVID relief package, the $1.9 trillion COVID relief package, and put a 2 or $3 trillion amendment on it for, you know, roads and bridges and infrastructure and broadband and everything else, as long as everything in that amendment also meets the criteria for for uh, reconciliation. In other words, it has to have something to do with the budget. It has to have something to do with either raising taxes or spending money. And certainly infrastructure is all about both. And the Senate parliamentarian, much to everyone's shock, said, sure, you can do that. And so now the debate is, what do we do? I mean, we've got a, a, a between two and three trillion dollar package right now that has you know, the, the details of which have been laid out by people like uh, Secretary Buttigieg and Vice President Harris. You've got progressives and, and, and many other Democrats who don't even identify themselves as progressives saying, you know, we could do bigger, we could do bigger than this because we're talking about two trillion dollars over a 10 year period. That's like 200 million dollars a year right, if I'm doing my math right, and that's not a hell of a lot of money. If you want to see something really happen, and then, and then the question, of course, becomes also, how do you pay for it? And Biden had, or the Biden administration had initially proposed raising the corporate tax rate, which used to be up at 35%. And that's the top, by, by the way, that's the top tax rate. It doesn't mean that every corporation gets taxed, right? The 50 of the 155 of the 100 largest corporations in America have paid no income taxes in the last three years. To get taxed, number one, you have to show a profit. Now, all of those corporations were very, very profitable. And number two, you can't have moved any of that money into some foreign country or shoved it into some kind of loophole category, which they all did. 
So, you know, now you've got Janet Yellen, our Treasury Secretary, suggesting that we should have a worldwide tax on income because so many of these large American companies don't just do business in America. I wanted to, uh, to send a gift to a friend of mine who lives in Germany. I logged on to Amazon.de with my regular Amazon credentials. And, you know, I can read enough German on the screen to be able to buy the product and get it sent right to their family in Germany from the German Amazon website, okay? It's a multinational corporation. But it's based here, it started here, and, well, at the very least, the business it does here should be subject, the profits on the business it does here should be subject to corporate income tax. But then Joe Manchin comes along and says, oh, you know, I don't, we can't, you know, it's uh, maybe 25%. I'd take 25%. Keep in mind, it used to be 35%. Trump dropped it down to 21%. And it kind of more or less averaged around 28% over recent years. And so Joe Manchin is like, yeah, 25%. And David Sirota today in his, in his uh, Daily Poster, I think is the name of his newsletter, said, uh, you can track this right to Joe Manchin's major contributors who are in the whole private equity, you know, fiddling with money hedge fund space because they're all taking advantage of this particular loophole in Trump's tax bill. Many of them have even changed their form of corporation just so that they could take advantage of that tax loophole. And if you take, get rid of that tax loophole, they're going to have to spend some money to reinvent themselves all over again. And who wants to do that? So Manchin's trying to blow this up. And, this, and, he, and he says he's got five or six colleagues in the Senate, five or six other Democratic senators who are also taking big money from, from hedge funds and private equity groups. So that debate is going to happen, but what got real interesting is that that debate now does not have to involve Republicans. Up until, you know, I mean, this, this was the, the, the critical error in governing that both Bill Clinton and Barack Obama made. Presidents Clinton and Obama both believed, I, I think believed deep down inside, that for their ideas and, and legislation to have legitimacy, they had to have bipartisanship. They had to have Republicans sign off on it. And so Obama, for example, made all kinds of, of tweaks and changes to Obamacare, to his signature product, because Republicans said that was what was necessary to get their votes. They told him, hey, you got to do this and this and that, and then maybe we'll go along with it. And so he did this and this and this. And how many Republican votes did he get? Zero. Bill Clinton had the same problem. So, so the Biden administration has come along and said, yeah, we're all, we're all in favor of bipartisanship. We don't want anything, we don't want to do anything in the United States that, you know, doesn't have the support of some Republicans, but they don't have to be in Congress. We'll look at the opinion polls. You know, 80, 90% of Americans want our infrastructure rebuilt, and that includes a majority of Republicans. So if the Republicans in Congress say, no, screw them, we can do this without them. It's still bipartisan. So Democrats are now negotiating with themselves rather than with, with, with Republicans, which is like, you know, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and baruch Hashem. I mean, it's just like, it's like, finally they figured it out. Republicans have been doing this since the, since the 80s, since the Reagan administration saying, oh, yeah, we'll pass legislation without a single Democratic vote. We don't care. From, you know, some of Reagan's tax cuts and some of his most egregious policies all the way up to, to uh, Trump's tax cut. So I think it's a, a new day.